I appreciate the opportunity to be, uh, be able to talk uh, with you guys today, and thank you, Rod, for the invite. Um, some very familiar, uh, prominent names in this space, in the crowd, and um, I look forward to meeting you all at the end. So when I started this talk, um, uh, from the perspective of a gastroenterologist and a hepatologist, which is the study of the gut and, and liver, I started with a question of, well, what is the meaning of life? And not in a philosophical sense, but rather in the sense of what is the basic purpose of life. Um, all life forms need to achieve the same endpoint. We need to break down ingested complex material into their basic molecules, free fatty acids from fat, monosaccharides, which are, are simple sugars from more complex sugars, amino acids from protein. Uh, these are to be absorbed to use as a structural molecule um, as well as energy. And obviously we need to absorb other essential uh, comp components such as vitamins and minerals. So each species is different and um, how each species reaches this and the ways they enlist their gut microbiome and microbiota to do this differs. Um, and this is something that we've take, failed to take into account when we uh, encounter modern illness and in particular chronic illness. So differences in digestive physiology are quite important because they allow determination of the diet that is suitable for a particular species and how broad a range of foods an animal can eat. So we've got some pictures here um, that show animals that we primarily consider as herbivores um, eating animal, animal protein. So chickens, gorillas, um, even things like deer consuming, consuming meat. And, and, and the reality is in the setting of nutritional deprivation, if there's a food shortage in their usual preferred supply, these animals will venture out to consume foods such as this, although it is not ideal because their digestive tract is obviously not adapted to this. And the same in reverse, you know, we've got here a, a lion, this is a video and I've extracted some photos from it, a lion consuming grass, uh, but to be fair in the end, he does end up vomiting it out and wasn't, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't particularly impressed with what he'd, with what he'd consumed. Uh, but this is not something that's unusual. We, we often see our domesticated dogs do the same. Um, with regards to some digestion facts, um, in essence, no animals um, or no mammal in particular has evolved as a universal digester, a digester of uh, food. We've all got our specific nuances and, um, and, and specifications to what we can and cannot digest. So what are humans supposed to eat? This is an important question. So if you were to look at Google, um, uh, you end up with a very confusing uh, situation. For instance, if you were to Google red meat, um, you end up with a whole host of opinions with regards to is it carcinogenic, is it good for health, is it bad for health, does it cause heart disease? It's, it's a very confusing um, uh, situation. So then do we look to our doctors to uh, be able to provide us with nutritional advice? Uh, the, the, the reality is, medical school, the nutrition that we're taught there, and I think there's a lot of doctors in the crowd, and I'm sure you'll acknowledge that um, it really was poorly taught. And this 2019 systematic review showed that most medical students, or a vast majority of them, uh, did not feel sufficiently uh, confident to be able to give nutritional advice to their patients, although we know modern illness make, is primarily made up of, um, of uh, lifestyle-based uh, issues of which diet's a big component then do we look to our dietitians and nutritionists? Um, we could, but the problem here is we're basing, uh, their advice is generally based on this food pyramid, which we, I think most of us here would acknowledge uh, is not based on perfect science and really hasn't worked for the last few decades in which we've had it. Um, I don't think it's contributed to the obesity epidemic. However, it certainly hasn't helped uh, with the situation. So what we end up with is in a state of confusion. I think as a species, we're confused as to what to consume and what may be appropriate for us. So from my perspective, um, I wanted to try and reverse engineer the problem as in uh, we've got the human gut. Um, how do we work out what's, what's appropriate for us? Well, let's reverse engineer the human gut and find out what it's supposed to do. And that's what this talk's uh, based on. So I'd like to simplify the discussion by starting with the type of digestion, uh, digestion uh, systems that we've got in nature. 
So we've got the ruminant uh, foregut fermenters. These are things like the cows, the goat, the deer, and these have got a very complex stomach. We've got the non-ruminant foregut fermenters like the kangaroos and um, Columbus monkeys. And then we've got hind fermenters such as the horse. Um, we are what we call a mid-gut or an autoenzyme dependent digesters, and these are practically all carnivores, pigs, which are omnivorous creatures, humans and rodents. So what we've actually got is an extremely adaptable digestive tract. Species, species such as the pig and hu pigs and humans, we rely primarily on non-bacterial-based enzymatic breakdown of food, i.e. we're not reliant on bacteria, we make these enzymes ourselves. Uh, but we also gain some element of nutrition from hind gut fermentation where we are reliant on the microbiota to, uh, to extract those fuels for us, but it's a very low percentage in humans, and I'll, I'll go into some objective data on that a bit later. Anything to do with the gut microbiome is a partial bargain. So if we're utilising bacteria in our colon to ferment things like fibre and non-absorbable carbohydrates and even protein, it, it is definitely a partial bargain because the bacteria themselves utilise the components of these foods. They utilise the vitamins and the, and, the, and the energy sources such as short-chain fatty acids, so we get a partial uh, bit of what they've uh, generated for us. Um, the human gut is actually very, very simple. Um, it is made up of a very small stomach, a extensive small intestine, which is very, very proficient in producing enzymes uh, to cleave carbohydrate and uh, protein and fats, um, and a very shortened colon. As a colonoscopist and as an endoscopist, I can, I can guarantee that, that the, uh, the human colon is millimetres thick. It's a very, very thin wall system. Um, and you know, when we're taught as trainees, one of the risks of doing colonoscopy is a very real risk is perforation because it's so thin walled. Whereas it's very difficult to perforate the human stomach or the human uh, small bowel. Very, very thick wall system. So this in comparison to say animals such as the kangaroos, which you can see there, which have got very, very thick, large bowels. Um, sorry, the uh, uh, animals such as the, the hindgut absorbers, such as the horse, which have got very, very thick, large bowels. Now, that, it would be almost impossible uh, to perforate that with an instrument because of how thick that is. As humans, it is important to remember our colon is extremely short, extremely simple, not optimised for fermentation. Let's look at the ruminants. The ruminants, animals such as the cattle, the, these contain a very, very complex stomach, uh, four-chambered stomach. And what they do is it's so capacious, it's so big that they eat continuously nutrient-poor foods um, uh, for, for most of the day. And they spent most of, that, uh, most of that time consuming this food. And in the stomach, they've got plenty of bacterial species that basically ferment it for them. They generate their sugars, um, and, and fats through bacterial species within the stomach. They've got a very simple small intestine and a fairly um, simple large intestine as well. They're, they're not utilising that as much. It's all in the stomach for the ruminants. They get a very interesting thing called grain overload, which most farmers can talk about in, in depth. But in cattle-fed high-concentrate diets, where obviously in the modern world we, we feed the cattle in a certain way where we're selecting for optimal taste, which is something that humans desire, which is the fat or the marbling in meat, uh, where they're fed a high-grain concentrate, uh, they overwhelm the ability of the stomach uh, to be able to ferment all that starch. Some of it's broken down by their pancreas and brush borders in their small gut, but uh, they basically overwhelm that capacity and they can end up with um, quite severe uh, condition called grain poisoning. It occurs when they eat a large amount of grain. The bacteria in the room and gut produce a lactic acid which causes bloat, constipation, acidosis, slowing of the gut, and they can die within, um, within a day or 12, 12 to 24 hours uh, because of respiratory muscle paralysis. So it's a very real problem. So it shows you how when a, when a creature consumes a food source that it may not be optimised or evolved for, perhaps it does cause an issue. And that will relate to what, what we are going through as a species um, in terms of chronic illness, and I'll talk on that later. So just to reiterate, we've got autoenzyme digesters such as the pigs, the humans, the lions, rats, and basically any carnivores. Uh, we utilise a very, very acidic stomach. 
um, a very low pH. We've got a pancreas that's very proficient at, at producing enzymes that break down fat, protein, and carbohydrate. We've got a bile system that allows for um, appropriate um, absorption of fats, and we've got a complex small bowel, and as I mentioned earlier, a very, very simple large intestine. We're a species of primate, obviously, but in the human, a uh, colon represents only about 20% of the total volume of the digestive tract, whereas in uh, apes such as the gorillas and chimps, it's a large percentage, it's almost 50%. The sizable colons of most of these large body primates, it basically helps them with fermentation of low quality plant fibers, allowing for extraction of energy in the form of short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids, as we know, things such as butyrate, they're a ketone, a type of molecule. So it's a, a, a ketone molecule. It's very interesting that these creatures are utilizing fiber and carbohydrate, using their microbiome, giving them a reservoir in their colon to generate a fat. Um, so that is a very interesting concept. Humans amongst these uh, autoenzyme dependent omnivores are very, very poor at digesting uncooked plant fiber. Um, we've got an extremely wicked uh, pH value in our stomach. Uh, the pH value can drop under one. Uh, especially in young people. Of course, with the uh, age of proton pump inhibition, we've compromised to that, and uh, perhaps we're compromising digestion with this heavy use of proton pump inhibition, which is very prevalent. Um, and perhaps this is why we're, we are seeing conditions such as sarcopenia and osteoporosis amongst our elderly, and we just have to look to know that most of them are on proton pump inhibitors. The pH of our stomach reflects a lot about our evolutionary past, uh, because it shows us that at some point in our, in our evolutionary past, we've uh, been primarily scavengers or, or feeding on carrion that other animals have left behind. So in summary, with regards to what we are, we're a primate built for nutrient density. We've got a huge small bowel and a very short colon. Um, this leads to something called the expensive tissue hypothesis, which is a very elegant hypothesis, which shows that a high quality diet leads to a smaller, more simplistic gut, more specialized gut, which then frees up energy to feed something called the brain, uh, which we, in our case, is very, very energy hungry because of its size and capacity, which then leads to more complex foraging behaviors, which then leads to better hunting methods being employed, which then leads to, it's a positive feedback loop. So the gut and the brain are interchangeably related. Um, and we know that um, loosely in community, but it is, it is so well defined in evolutionary science. So are we a carnivore or an omnivore? We are basically between a uh, species such as a pig, which is an omnivore, and a dog. We're basically a carnivorous species capable of consuming an omnivore diet, very flexible. I think the best way to describe us probably is uh, cookinivores, okay? And this is something that's actually been, been coined by a lot of evolutionary biologists. And we're best to be classified as a spe species based on this is the fact that we cook our food to extract nutrients, cookinivores. No group of human that's ever lived um, in history or has been ever recorded has lived without cooking. Uh, we initiate food breakdown by various methods, storage, drying, marination, pounding, grinding. Cooking changes the palatability, digestibility, and the texture of foods, of course, removes toxins. Winston Churchill, a um, uh, very wise man, said, the farther back we look into history, the clearer the future becomes. And I think um, that's, uh, that's uh, spot on. And to do that, we'll look at a species called Homo erectus, which is the hominid that preceded Homo sapiens. We're about 200,000 years old as a species, which is a very, very young species. But the Homo erectus, uh, probably the most successful hominid that's ever lived, lived for 2 million years. And it's quite important to know that these guys had mastered fire at about 500, 600,000 years ago. Uh, but they were starting to use it through fossil records about 1.8 million years ago. So, and this contributed hugely to a development of a more complex brain because we could cook our food to release more nutrients. And I'll touch on that in a, in a, in a bit. But they were building herts which could get um, temperatures up to 500 degrees Celsius. So very, very complex cooking systems that these guys were developing even before they became homo sapiens. So there's this big... Uh, push for raw food diets, and you see it a lot, especially in vegan communities, and, and 
In previous millennia, this would have been impossible because of the rates of infection in uncooked food. Infection is now less of a problem. Even if we ignored the uh, problems of infection, we are less well adapted to consuming uh, raw versus cooked food. Modern humans on all uh, raw diets, they tend to be a, uh, underweight. There's been large studies done on this. Um, there tends to be chronic energy shortage and often uh, things like their cycles and um, reproductive, um, uh, reproductive uh, health can, can be compromised. They're also less rewarding from a palatability perspective. They demand a lot of mastication and ingestion time, and I don't think we unlock enough energy to satisfy the demands of the energy-hungry brain. It comes back to the brain. Cooking increases energy gain, especially the energy from carbohydrate-rich foods and protein-rich foods, and cooking also increases the availability of some nutrients. Uh, cooking is important in the sense to detoxify food, although we've got this very acidic stomach and proteases that break down and kill most bacteria in food if we were to ingest these high-risk food. There are, con uh, there are bacteria species such as Salmonella, Staph and Listeria. These are a ma major public health concern. These immediately kill by uh, high temperature cooking, of course. Are there any disadvantages to cooking? Um, I've searched the literature for this. There is perhaps some loss of nutrients. There's some talk of formation of toxic compounds such as acrylamide, but the evidence isn't convincing. What I found interesting was advanced glycation end products, which occurs when you cook proteins and fats, especially poor quality fats, in the presence of sugars at high temperatures, which is a very popular way of preparing fast food, of course possibly may contribute to uh, metabolic syndrome such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease, although these studies tend to be primarily mechanistic. Um, it's quite, a, um, quite an interesting phenomena there. When we get into processed food in the human diet. We, we prepare and transform this food so it's more readily digested. You know, we use methods such as grinding, pounding, fermentation, drying, salting, cooling, burying. But in modern times, in the last 150 years, we use very novel methods, heat sterilization, microwaving, mechanical refrigeration, irradiation and vacuum packing. And I'm sure in the future there'll be more techniques to come. But now what we're doing is so heavily processed that 80% of what we consume um, comes from something processed. That's, we're talking about general society. 90% of what is cooked definitely comes from processed food, which is a problem. I'd like to touch a little bit on digestion of grains in humans. The grinding of grain, we think, started based on, uh, on um, archaeological records about 30,000 years ago. It's basically, we can tell this through the discovery of starch grains on the surface of grinding stones. In the absence of grinding and cooking, starches are basically not available as a human food source. So here we've got the type of grinding stones uh, that they're using. It's very, very important to know that without the ability to grind starch into flour, we've got no way of ac actually accessing uh, that as an energy source. 70% of the dietary intake in modern societies uh, comes, comes from uh, this type of food. Very interesting fact, grainivorous birds, these are birds that, that consume grain, they lack cellulases exactly like humans. No mammals contain cellulases to break down the uh, tough uh, plant fibres. Uh, some earthworms and, and some species of, um, uh, of um, uh, uh, small creatures, insects in particular, they do have that, but we lack it. So what these birds do is they, they consume st small stones and hold it within a very muscular part of their stomach called the gizzard. They essentially create a biological uh, grinding stones. They use the stones within the stomach to grind the uh, starch that they consume. So the advantages of grain, what are the advantages? And I'll put that in inverted commas. It definitely free time for the development of technology and culture. There's no doubt about that. We had food abundance. We had easy food storage because this is a low risk food that doesn't spoil very easily. We had efficiency from digestion of processed foods as in we pre-processed it before we consume it. Um, but what interestingly occurred, the fecundity increased. So reproductive rates went through, went through the roof. They, they increased significantly. And uh, so we went from a population of a few million pre-agriculture 10,000 years ago to the billions that we see now. And we've got issues, obviously, with sustainability and planetary health and so forth. So agriculture certainly didn't help uh, from that perspective. The question that's asked is, did it improve human health? Um, based on the fossil records, it doesn't seem to be the case. We have actually gotten weaker as a species. Our bones are thinner, our dentitions deteriorated. Um, our stature decreased, um, 
And so it hasn't really helped us from that perspective as well. But in these last 10,000 years, and it's, uh, it was fascinating to l listen to Professor Ken Sakaris' talk on, on um, iron. In the last 10,000 years, we've had rapid adaptations um, to agriculture. We've, some of us in the world, in particular the Northern European populations, we've learned to be able to process the sugar in milk in adulthood. Uh, lactase is an enzyme that's lost after childhood, however, some sort of um, evolutionary um, pressures arose where we started consuming the milk of other animals, which when you really step back and think about it, it it's no other species does that. Um, but these populations that were able to develop this mutation are still able to do that now. Uh, but vast majority of the world, places like Asia and, um, and uh, Africa, certain tribes in Africa that can do it, but most of these people have no ability to process milk into adulthood and often makes them quite bloated and, and, and sick. We now term it a disease, the, the, the lactase deficiency, but the reality is if you look at the ethnic group of the person presenting with that sort of problem and you measure their intestinal lactase, often they were never evolved to uh, create that enzyme anyway. Uh, we also had something called amylase amplification, so the genetic uh, coding regions which code for amylase, which is an enzyme that breaks down starch, amplified rapidly in these last um, uh, 10 to 15,000 years as we started incorporating more starch into our diet. Fascinating mutation because it, it, the, it, the, we domesticated the dog about uh, 50 to 60,000 years ago, we think, but the dogs that we had domesticated, their gene, uh, gene um, coding for amylase also starts amplifying at the same time we start performing agriculture. Um, and, and it shows that the dogs were starting to eat in a very similar way that we were as well. We also had something called melanin silencing, uh, which occurred about 7,000 years ago, where the brown uh, or, or the, um, uh, the European, uh, Europeans of, uh, of Northern Europe um, seven to 8,000 years ago, where they start silencing the melanin gene to allow for depigmentation to make vitamin D in their skin from the sun as they started moving away from um, vitamin D rich foods, such as organ meats and fat soluble, um, uh, uh, given that vitamin D is a fat soluble enzyme, as they moved away from this carnivorous type of way of eating to agriculture, they had to learn to make vitamin D in their skin. I think the same thing occurred with iron, uh, to touch on the topic of hemochromatosis. I think the C2A2Y gene, um, and hopefully we can touch on it a bit later, is an autosomal dominant trait. Um, I'm always very interested in autosomal dominant traits because uh, if they were pathogenic or as in they were detrimental to the species, it would be silenced pretty quickly. These, um, these, these people would not be able to reproduce to pass the gene on. The fact that it's so prevalent suggests that it had some sort of evolutionary advantage. As we were consuming less dietary iron, um, we, we start developing these mutations to try and absorb it. And I think the same thing occurred with cholesterol absorption. And I wonder about with a lot of these familial hypercholesterolemias, which we see, which tend to be polygenic, are actually because we moved away from a higher fat diet that we try to adapt to all of this by increasing, um, increasing absorption capacity. To touch quickly on fermentation, humans and early hominids uh, first ate fruits. Um, often these were, were rotting um, as they'd fallen off the tree. Fermentation was occurring through the bacterial species that were fermenting it. The alcohol itself actually is a, is a energy source. It's converted to triglyceride in the liver and uh, early humans ate these fermented fruits, converted the um, alcohol to triglyceride and uh, used it as an energy source in a time of scarcity. Um, Fermentation, uh, we started controlling that later on, obviously, and, and started using it for our own um, utility and consumption through alcohol. We do it with things such as dairy products um, to, to make things like uh, yogurt, um, sorry, milk to make yogurt, and we obviously use it for um, uh, bread as well. So I want to touch on this topic. This is a, it's probably one of the most important slides uh, in my presentation. Fibre is touched on a lot and, and we're always pushing our, our patients uh, to increase their fibre intake. Please increase your fibre intake. But what is fibre fundamentally? As I said earlier, fibre is fermented by the hindgut or the colon to liberate a ketone, short-chain fatty acids. There's a variety of ketones, but butyrate is the most common one. 
Um, the hindgut production absorption of short-chain fatty acids obviously allows the an animal to have some maintenance energy. It only accounts for about 2% of a dog's um, energy intake, so that's a very low amount. It's about 10 to 31% for pigs. It's huge for hindgut digesters such as horses, and that's why they've got these very thick um, uh, colons, because that's where these creatures such as the horses and the rabbits tend to get most of their energy. They have to ferment fibre to create a fat as a fuel. In humans, it only accounts for 6 to 9%, a very, very low amount. So why is it that, that this food pyramid pushes the concept of, of fibre? And that's, um, that's part of the issue of why we've got illness now. Uh, we end up with this pyramid with a protein dilution, uh, which is a huge problem. As you can see, protein's right up the top, and uh, there's something called the protein leverage hypothesis, which I, it's a hypothesis that I absolutely love, which is that, that unless there's enough quality protein, you will not be able to achieve satiety. If there's no satiety, well, you end up with a vicious cycle. The vicious cycle for us in modern day society, the way I see it is that saturated fat is bad. That's kind of what's pushed out there. High fiber is essential. Red meat causes disease. So what we end up with fundamentally is a protein dilution in the diet. As a result of that, we have issues with satiety and we have a tendency to overeat hyperpalatable foods, which we're surrounded by. We end up with a state of energy toxicity, which is what obesity and diabetes basically is. So on that time scale, we've had this enormous journey, a two to four million year journey, and we'd gained control of um, fire about 1.9 million years ago. We introduced grains 9,000 years ago, which is not long ago. But in the last 100 to 200 years, we, we've done some pretty amazing things, not necessarily for our benefit, because now we've got industrial agriculture, you've got pesticides, hormones, mechanization, we've got chemical manipulation of foods, genetic manipulation more recently, and globalizations, which is basically food out of season. Um, if you liked peaches, um, you could probably consume that all year round, even though it's no longer seasonal because we get it from uh, other countries and, and, and we bring it in. So that in itself is a problem. Uh, wheat today, uh, the way we see it, is no longer the wheat that we consumed 30 to 40 years ago. The amount of gluten in the wheat is increased significantly. We're doing this to try and maximize yield. It's, uh, it's a natural pesticide as well, so the insects don't want it, but we're consuming it. Um, and and um, we're getting sicker as a species. Um, it's often sort of, in, in healthcare, the, the concept of a paleolithic diet's frowned upon, as in it's a bit of a voodoo science. But the reality is the science um, shows that th this really does work. Uh, this was a study done in the 80s uh, in our Australian Aboriginals, showed a marked improvement in carbohydrate and lipid metabolism when these diabetic Australians were told to go back to their uh, traditional lifestyle, which was very, very rich in protein, animal protein. That's a 65% of their energy was sustained, uh, obtained from animal protein and, 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 and fat, very little from carbohydrates, and the carbohydrates that they were consuming were very fibrous, uh, very, very difficult to eat. They were not processed. They were obviously foraging more as well, so they're no longer sedentary, and uh, it led to reversion um, uh, of, of their type 2 diabetes, which we know is the concept that we should be uh, applying to all our patients uh, in the modern day. Just very quickly, a few slides on plant versus animal protein. No doubt that plants contain protein, but I, can our digestive tract access them? Not as efficiently. So the fate of amino acids derived from plant sources is different to that derived from animal sources, as in the leucine content is so much lower that I don't think it allows for optimal muscle health or muscle protein synthesis, which then leads to the issue of fragility and frailty. And of course, we know muscle's an important uh, organ to regulate uh, a lot of the endocrine systems. Um, also, the different structure of plant proteins versus animal proteins makes them uh, resistant to proteolysis in the gut. And they contain tough walls, uh, cell walls and fibers that impede the access of these enzymes within our gut to actually break them down. So, not to mention the plants versus animal proteins, there's a lot of anti-nutritional factors in, a, in, in plant proteins, phytic acid, protease inhibitors, tannins, lectins, oxalates, saponins, there's, there's a whole heap of them. So they just come with their baggage, um, unfortunately. So just my final points to, to end on is, um, you know, we're obviously a, a, a primate, we're a, 
Uh, we, we scavenged for most of our four million history, then we fundamentally learned to hunt, um, became an apex predator, then we learned to cook a few hundred thousand years ago, uh, which increased brain size, then we learned to farm, build civilization, we built the concept of money, and then we demonized nutrient dense foods in the last few decades, um, such as red meat and animal source proteins. Then we built a uh, environment geared towards making money from hyper palatability foods rich in both sugar and fat, which we know is, is automatically um, hyper -palatable, palatable to the human brain. So this is the issue. And just uh, to, to end on, um, on, on this topic, we've, we've forgotten how important protein is to regulate hedonistic behaviors. There's plenty of studies that show that a higher protein diet will improve satiety and it kills a lot of these uh, hedonistic habits that we have with this re poor relationship to food as well. So I think the protein leverage hypothesis should be utilized more and we should be teaching patient, patients to prioritize protein uh, with, with every meal so that they're not eating constantly through the, the course of the day. I acknowledge there's some more complex factors that come into it like food addictions and whatnot, uh, but I think um, uh, on, on the whole, uh, that concept can be applied well to most. Thank you.